Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord God Almighty, the maker and possessor of heaven and earth. Uh, this is David Aigbona Ministries. And I am David Aigbona, and this is our service. Just one moment. Awesome. I was sorry I am coming on a little late. I was having some form of difficulty in going live. For some strange reason, my computer was refusing to go live. But glory to God, this service will still hold. Good morning, Laura. Thank you for joining. Hallelujah. I hope I'm um, clear. Can you take a look? Move this light closer. Hallelujah. Today, we have another communion and anointing service. And the title of the teaching of today is Marriage, a Covenant. And not it's not a contract. Marriage, a covenant, not a contract. You, If you have... Um, watched the service, the video. Good morning, Jacqueline Hawking. God bless you and happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. On Friday, we had a special session where I taught on uh, women submitting, not as in slavery, but as a co-laborer in God's vineyard. Today we are looking at marriage as a covenant and not a contract. I want you to please stay on till the end. You are indeed going to be blessed and the Lord has something for you. Please do share this video. We are going to save a whole lot of homes by doing that. And I want to thank those of you who have been following this ministry from the beginning and even from whenever you started following this ministry. Thank you for your support, your prayers, your encouragement, your participation. I love reading your comments. I love hearing from you. Some of you do send me messages and ask me questions. Good morning, Tina Perry. Thank you for joining. I'm really glad to read your comments, your messages. People send me videos. It's good. Thank you. Do not stop. God bless you. So we're going to be praying. We'll have a time of prayer today, a short period of prayer. And then we would worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And then we are going to hear the word of God, the teaching for today. We're going to be teaching uh, for this service is marriage, a covenant, not a contract. After the teaching, we are going to take our communion and then the anointing oil will be prayed on. So I welcome everyone. Ega, Carolina, long time, long time no see. Thank you all for joining. I may not be mentioning your name right now, but I am glad you are here. So let's begin by giving God thanks for what he has done in our lives. God is so good. He has been faithful. I want you to give him thanks. Just give him thanks. You can share this video, please, as we give God thanks. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done, what you are going to do. We thank you for what you are doing right now. We are grateful in the name of Jesus Christ. We, Lord God, acknowledge you. You are good. You are kind. Lord, you are faithful. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father, for all you've done for us, for all you are going to do. We give you praise and thanks. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the food, for the water, for the air we breathe. We thank you for the shelter. Lord, we thank you for keeping us from harm. We thank you that we are alive. We thank you for making us a blessing 
to people far and near. We are grateful in the mighty name of Jesus. We give you praise. We give you thanks in Jesus' mighty name. I want you to thank the Lord for uh, your family. Thank Him for your loved ones. Thank Him for your walk with Him. Thank Him for your walk with Him. Just give Him thanks. Lord, we are grateful. We praise You. We lift Your name high, O oh God. We give You thanks. You are faithful. Thou, O oh Lord, art our shield. You are our defense. We give You thanks for our family. We thank You. Things are getting better. Things are getting better. We do not walk by sight. We walk by faith. By faith in your word. We don't walk by sight. We don't walk by sight. But by faith. And we know that you make all things work together for our good. Therefore, we do not look at the things happening from a physical point of view. We look at them through eyes of faith. That you are working things out for our good. And we thank you that all is getting better because we love you. According to your word in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we give you praise and we give you thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want you right now to take time to um, let go of every pain and hurt. It's so important to let go of every pain and every hurt and ask the Lord to heal your heart. All right, let go of every pain. So I want you to ask God to heal you of the pain and of the hurt. Ask Him to heal you right now. Say, Lord, I want healing in the mighty name of Jesus. I want your healing. Heal me of every pain. Heal me, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Heal me, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Heal me, Lord God. Heal me, and I will be healed. Oh Lord, give us a heart that forgives, that forgives of things immediately. Lord, we pray, help us, Lord God, that we will not hold on to the past, we will not hold on to grudges, but we will forgive when we are hurt. We will let go of every offense. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. Help us heal our hearts. Let your healing power flow. Let your rivers of living water flow by our soul, O oh Lord. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Confess your sins unto the Lord right now. Ask him for mercy. Confess your sins unto him, asking him for mercy. Asking him for mercy. Say, Lord, have mercy and forgive. Have mercy and forgive in the mighty name of Jesus. Confess those sins you've committed in your heart, in your mind, with your words and things you have done that are wrong. Ask for mercy. Oh Lord, have mercy on us, Lord God. Have mercy. We confess our sins unto you, Lord. Sins of adultery, of loss, of bitterness, of, uh, uh, of foolish speaking, of sinful thoughts and words and actions. Lord, forgive us for disobedience. Forgive us, Lord God, for every sin. We have con uh, that is confessed, Lord. Open our eyes to see areas in our lives that we need repentance, Lord. And have mercy upon us. Even those sins we don't know about, have mercy upon us. Forgive our iniquities. Forgive our transgressions. Forgive our presumptuous sins. Have mercy. Take pride, anger, and bitterness away from us, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, may your name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. And I want you right now to ask the Lord for understanding of his word. His word is coming forth today. Ask him for understanding of his word. Say, Lord, grant me understanding of your word. Give me understanding of your word, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Give me understanding, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Lord, oh Lord, we thank you for this service. We declare it open in the mighty name of Jesus. And we ask, Lord, that you give us understanding of your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that wherever this service is participated in, that, Lord, your presence will be manifest there. Your power will come upon each and every participant. We pray, Heavenly Father, you will draw people to yourself through this service. We pray, Lord God, that your word will go forth with power to save, heal, and deliver, and that signs and wonders will be done in the name and to the glory of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that this feed shall not be cut, but it shall go clear, and one single feed, it will not be broken. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, take control. Heal every heart. Heal everybody and soul. Heal every, every spirit, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will restore the years that have been wasted. Restore homes. Restore marriages. Restore focus. Restore destinies. We pray in the name of Jesus. Let that which was destroyed come back to life that good thing that was destroyed let it come back to life we pray in the mighty name of jesus we bind and forbid from functioning every evil spirit and force that will try to hinder this service in the mighty name of jesus glory to your name father we give you praise in jesus mighty name and we declare this service in open in jesus name Amen. I welcome every one of you. I see end time solution, end time salvation ministries. Thank you for joining. Everyone joining, God bless you. I may not mention your name now, but I want you to know that I'm really glad to see you and to know that you are there. God sees you. God loves you. Some comments I do not see. Some comments are hidden from me. I have noticed it. Some comments are hidden from me. I may see it in one device, the other device I won't see it. Some comments I have seen and they disappear. But I want you to know that God sees you and God is blessing you. I welcome you to this um, communion service. I am David Eichbonna and this is David Eichbonna Ministries. We are going to worship the Lord for a few minutes and then the teaching will start. And the topic is marriage, a covenant not a contract. You are going to see how, how marriage is a covenant, not a contract. I thank you all who have been praying for my family and uh, uh, thank you for praying for my wife. She ought to be the one leading this session right now, this praise and worship. She may, She is um, unable to do so today, but by God's grace, she will be back leading it soon. So keep her in prayers, praying for her health, that God will perfect that which concerns her in her body and every aspect of her life. Thank you for praying for this family. I'm going to play a song right now. And um, as usual, I have to say this so that I don't have any copyright infringement. I do not own rights to this song. I do not own rights to this song. So please do worship the Lord with this song and um, immediately after I'll begin teaching. It's by Kent Henry, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Hallelujah. I'll post the song as a comment, a link to it. You can also um, later on worship even more. Thank you for your comments. So we begin the teaching now. Please do share this video. Please do share it. Let's get people uh, blessed. So marriage, a covenant, it's not a contract. The first thing we need to... Uh, I believe that right now God is healing a lot of homes and a lot of hearts. Many marriages are not how they should be. Many marriages are not going the direction God intended. But God has his way of helping us. And you must understand that when you are faithful to the covenant, God rewards your faithfulness. When you are in a marriage with a partner who isn't cooperative, you are in a marriage with a partner that's difficult, you begin to labor out of love. You labor out of love because uh, what ought to have been easy becomes difficult, but yet you labor and it is out of love for God and for your uh, family. The Bible says this, that God is not unrighteous as to forget your labor of love. So God will not forget your labor of love. So whatsoever, if you are in a marriage that's not as easy as it should be, and when you are in a marriage with a partner that's not acting the way he should, remember, God rewards your labor of love. So keep it up. Do not uh, be weary in well-doing. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, Do not be weary in well-doing. God rewards your labor of love. And so the definition of a contract is a legal uh, binding agreement. Yeah, right? It's a binding agreement it's legally binding between two or more parties so now what is so uh, special about uh, the contract sorry I'm just trying to get something done okay what's the difference between the contract and the covenant because a covenant is also a legal binding agreement between two or more parties the difference is this a contract is an agreement to receive compensation or payment in exchange for a good or service. A contract is an agreement to receive compensation or payment in exchange for a good or service that's a contract you give and you receive you receive you receive because you are giving it's a contract but when god deals with us he deals with us as covenant true covenant and he established marriage as a covenant what is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement. It's also a legal binding agreement to become something or someone to the other party. A contract is to give in order to receive. A covenant is to become someone or something to another party. So a covenant, trans, a covenant is a transformatory relationship. A contract is a transactory relationship. A, con, a contract is transaction. I want this and so I am going to give this. A covenant is a transformatory relationship. You transform, you become. 
you become something to someone you become someone to another party it transforms when God entered into covenant with uh, the nation of Israel he said I will be your God you will be my people When God entered into covenant with Abraham, he didn't ask Abraham, give me uh, your weekly harvest. He didn't ask Abraham, give me half of your lands. No. He said, I will be your God. I will establish my covenant with you and your descendants to be God over them forever. God said, walk before me and be perfect. That covenant was a transformatory covenant. God transformed that man into from Abraham to Abraham. Abraham meant exalted father. God changed his name to Abraham, father of many nations. God transformed that man from being him and just himself to being a father to many nations because God will be a father to him. It transformed Abraham's life. Abraham did not need to give God anything for him to get it. That is covenant. And the covenant we have with God today through Jesus Christ is that he is our father and we are his children. God did not establish that covenant by saying, that everyone who wants to be a believer must pay a certain amount of money. He says, if you want to be my son, acknowledge me as your father, and I will become a father to you. Give your heart to me, I will give myself to you. It's transformatory. We are transformed into the image of Christ. No, Abraham is not a God. No, Agar... What I what I, I, I said is God transformed Abraham from being a regular guy to being the father of many nations. He changed his name to symbolize that from Abram, which meant exalted father, to Abraham, which meant father of many nations. And he, God Almighty, will be a father to Abraham and his descendants. So now, the covenant is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are transformed by faith to become children of God. And he is our father. That is a covenant. And the contract is different. The contract is based on earthly principles of trade contract is based on earthly principles of trade give and receive now when god established marriage he established it to represent his relationship uh, the relationship between christ and the church he did that through marriage to to show us the relationship that Christ will be the head of the church and the church will be his body there will be a a transformation of mankind so now let us to understand marriage better let's go to where it started from let's go to marriage how it began it began in the Garden of Eden. God had created the, the first human being, Adam. He had created Adam. And the first time God says something, you know, every time he created something, look at Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. Each time he created something, the Bible says, and God saw it was good. But the first time God says something wasn't good is that the man was alone. God said it isn't good that this man is alone. 
I will make him a helper compatible with him. That's what it means by a helper meet for him. That is a helper compatible with him. And what does God do? God causes a deep sleep to fall. I hope they are charging. A deep sleep to fall upon Adam. Or rather, Adam to fall into a deep sleep. Adam sleeps deeply. And God performs the first surgery. He takes away a rib from Adam and seals it up with flesh. And with that rib, he forms a woman. Why did God not take the woman out of the... Didn't, why didn't he just create a woman from the ground? Because he created Adam from the ground. Why did he not create a woman from the ground? God wanted the woman to have the exact DNA of the man. That there will be a perfect match. They will be 100% the same species. If he had formed from the ground, it would have had a different DNA. Every animal God created has its own DNA. That is the reason why you, uh, scientists can check the hair. Uh, they, if they find hair on the floor, they can check and say, this, DNA, this is the DNA of a bear, the DNA of a monkey, the DNA of, a, of whatever animal. God wanted the male and female to have exactly the same DNA so that they will be one, compatible with each other of the same level. Eve was in Adam. God simply brought her out. And before God showed Adam Eve, he brought the animals he brought the animals and Adam named them as different species, showing that he knew his kind. But when God brought Eve to Adam, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and then we'll go to verse 21 to 25. I'm going to see that when Adam saw Eve, he recognized her, her as his bones and flesh. God wanted them to have the same species. Sorry, the same DNA, so that they can work together. Go ahead. Come. They can work together to fulfill his plan for them. My son Benjamin is going to read Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and then you will move on to verse 21. Or just read from 18 to 25. Okay? All right. And the Lord said, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed in every beast of the field and every fowl air, uh, and every fowl of the air and brought them out and brought them unto Adam to see what he could he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to a cattle. And to the fowl, and, and and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But Adam, there was not found any help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God, which the Lord God had taken from man. Made he, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is, not, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because, because she was taken out of man. There, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall claim unto his wife and there shall be one flesh and they were and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were and were not ashamed. Ashamed. Hallelujah. So now we see here that the first thing God said was not good was that Adam should be alone. There should be a partner. He should have someone 
to interact with on his level. That's what the Bible says, a help meet for him. That's a help suitable for him. One to interact on his level. So brethren, before you get married, for those of you who are not married, before you get married, look for someone with your spiritual DNA. Don't look for a helper that is cute. Look for a helper that is suitable for you. A helper with the same spiritual DNA. Do not give yourself to an unbeliever. If you are married to someone who is an unbeliever, keep praying for him. All right? And speaking to those who have not gotten married right now, do not get married do not give yourself to someone who does not have the same spiritual dna as you have god did not form the woman from the ground separately he took her from the man so that they will have the same spiritual dna do not be unequally yoked to an unbeliever because you as a believer in christ you have the dna of god you have the dna of christ jesus by reason of your new breath, you have transformed to a new creation. The Bible says that uh, he that is in Christ is a new creature. The old things have passed away and all things have become new. That should be uh, 1 Corinthians 5.17, I believe. So, you have become a new creature. You, are diff- you, are, you were not existing before. You have a new DNA, the DNA of Christ. He lives in you, all right? So, do not give yourself over to someone who does not have that same DNA. But if you're already in a marriage with someone that doesn't have faith in Christ Jesus, don't leave, keep praying. Though God will touch that person the way he touched you. So now, that's advice from the scriptures. So now, God brought Eve to Adam and Eve recognized her. And you know what? He's, he he, has, he Establish the covenant when Adam looked at her and said, This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That was a statement of covenant. By making that statement, he affirmed, he agreed to be in covenant with his wife, in that he recognized that she came out of him, and so he had the natural tendency to protect her and to guide her and Eve also responded by recognizing that she came out of Adam and so she was to be um, in unity with Adam the man and they should be together as one they are equals but one is the leader over the other one is the head over the other oh Jesus sorry about that I don't know how it happened. My phone just fell off. All right. Are we back? I think we are still live. Sorry about that. Something fell. Benjamin, please come help me get to this. Okay. Okay. I think we are still on. Fine. I'm going to go on. So now, I have to be careful with this. Eve responded, recognizing that, oh, this is her leader. She came from the man. And so they were to walk together. Her role was to be his partner, his helper, to fulfill their common destiny, to do that which God has uh, proposed for them to do. So the covenant was established. The marriage covenant was established. Right? It was established. Now, Adam did not tell Eve at that moment, Eve, you are my employee. I'll pay you a salary to help me. He didn't say, Eve did not approach Adam and say, okay, now we are in this together. And, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Tina. So, I'm visible. That's good. Sorry about that little shaking there. My phone fell off from what I was supporting it with. Now, she responded by acknowledging Adam as her source, that she came from him. They were one. Together, 
one flesh flesh and bones God sealed it up do you know I've been trying to avoid using Adam Eve until now now I'm going to tell you why I kept saying the man and the woman God regarded their union seriously so serious that he gave the two, he did not give the woman a separate name the name Eve came only after they had fallen until they fell they had one name and that name was Adam God called the woman Adam. He called the man Adam. He called the both of them one name. We are going to see it in Genesis chapter 5 verse 2. You will be amazed. That is how God sees a husband and a wife as one. And so God did not give the woman a separate name. When God brought her to Adam, Adam named her as his flesh of his flesh, bone of his bones the woman the man with a womb go ahead and here david my elder son will read genesis chapter 5 verse 2 male and female created he them and then and blessed them and called their name adam in the day when they were created yeah some newer translations try to alter it to say mankind but the, the Bible says Adam. That was the name. God referred to the two of them. He referred to them as Adam. You can see it in my Bible here. Chapter 5, verse 2. It's written in verse 2. Yeah. And he called their name Adam. So God referred to the two of them by one name. When sin entered, the relationship went from being a covenant to a contract. While they were in the Garden of Eden, Eve had as much ownership of the resources as Adam had. Adam was not richer than Eve. Eve was not of less authority over the animals than Adam. The lions respected her. The elephants respected her just the way they respected the man. Both of them were Adam. They both had exact powers. God did not give the man dominion over the woman. He gave the man headship over the woman. You can go back to the message I taught last on uh, wife submit. Are you kidding Go there. You see, I explained a lot there. It was to be a love cooperation relationship. All right. God did not tell them, did not give the man dominion over the woman like the man had dominion over other things created on earth. It was a partnership working together, recognizing the husband as head over the wife. Okay. Being a head does not enslave the other party. It only means you sacrifice more. You sacrifice more and you are responsible for the other party. God holds you responsible for the other party. If the other party is messing up, God will punish that party. So if the wife is messing up, God will punish her. God will judge her for her acts of uh, indiscretion and rebellion. But God expects the head to do the best he can to help the body. And so that it's a principle of headship. That was how it was established. God, when God called Adam, the two of them came, one spoke on behalf. So there was no chorus answer. It was an organized relationship. Please do share this video. Please do share. And I welcome everyone. I'm not seeing many com um, all the comments, but keep them coming. I will acknowledge those ones I see later on. 
Keith, but thank you for joining. So now, it was a relationship based on responsibility. The husband responsible for the wife, right? The wife cooperating with the husband. That's what submission means in the Bible. Cooperation, working together, recognizing a leader. Okay, so now God regarded these two as one, and so He called them one name, Adam. After seeing to your tents each person, so now today, because of sin, there is now a contractual relationship in marriage. People now approach marriage as a contract, not as a covenant. I told you before that a contract is an agreement to receive compensation or payment in exchange for goods and services. Whereas a covenant is an agreement to become something or someone to the other party. And that is what marriage was, a covenant. But when sin came in, it became a contract. And the contract became the woman says to the man, I will, be your, I will become a liability to you and I will give you my body. And the man looks at the woman and says, okay, I need somebody to boss over and I need someone to cook for me. I need someone to have children for me. And that is why I'll get married to you. It became a thing of, I have this to offer. What do you have to offer? It became a contract, a transactory relationship rather than a transformatory relationship. The idea that the man must provide everything for the woman to her satisfaction came in. The idea that uh, the man must have a higher or a uh, a larger source of income than the woman came into play. Remember, in the garden, Adam was not richer than Eve. Eve was not richer than Adam. They had full access to all resources equally. But they operated as a team. So now, because of that fall, I'm going to show you where this idea that uh, women assume themselves to be liabilities, that they have nothing to offer other than their body and their cooking skills. Let me show you. It came as a consequence of sin. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. God spoke about it. He mentioned it that it was going to happen at some time. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. We are going to see where it, it came into being. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. And their, con- and, their conce- and their conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth child, children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. You see that? God was telling them the consequence of sin is that what he didn't intend would now happen. The man will now have rulership before the man was not ruling over the woman he was her leader he was not a dictator over her but now husbands are going to become dictators over their wives and the wives will become dependents on their husbands that is why i said and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over you women wives are going to become dependent financially and otherwise on their husbands who will become their bosses. That is a consequence of sin. The relationship was taken from being a transformatory relationship, a covenant, to becoming a contract. You know, people often quote this scripture that he that cannot take care of his own is an infidel. But you see, a lot of scriptures have been misquoted based on this error. Now, based on the consequence of sin in marriage, in this verse 16 of Genesis chapter 3, we began to create theology. 
Paul when writing, saying he that cannot take care of his own is like an infidel. He was not addressing it to men. If you go earlier to the earlier verses, he was speaking about widows. That there are those who are widows who are young. They should go get married and not be a burden to others. But that amongst the church, those who had widows should in their family should help them. That was what that statement was made for. It wasn't regarding that he, because you see he there, it must be every husband that cannot, that does not have more money than his wife is an infidel. This has led to a lot of unnecessary friction in homes because the man out of fear of being regarded as an infidel suppresses every attempt by the wife every opportunity of the wife for advancement if he sees his wife is getting a better job than he he will try to spoil that opportunity to get her fired to get her to leave that job making all manner of excuses it's not that he hates his wife but because he has been erroneously taught that being the husband means he must have a higher income based on the error that came in in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. He has to be the boss. The boss uh, has to have a better office than every other person. You know that. A boss office should not be like the others. A boss has to be financially uh, more remunerated than the subordinates. So that is where the transactory thing came in, true sin. When a wife is earning more than the husband, it does not give her the right to belittle the husband. The husband still remains the head because when God established the covenant of marriage, it was not based on economics. It was based on revelation and purpose. It was not based on economics. So when we say, when you see some women, when they earn higher than their husbands, all hell is let loose. And they have problems and they are angry. Why shouldn't he respect me? I have more money than he does. The relationship between husband and wife is covenant. The man becomes the head over the wife. The wife becomes the helper, the partner, the co-laborer to the husband. It is not based on economics, education, social standing. It's based on purpose. And so many a times we have husbands that persecute their wives simply because the wife is earning more. And we have wives that are rebellious, insubordinate, arrogant to their husbands because they were taught and they assume that the authority of the home is based on economics, on financial power. It is wrong. We see here that because of sin, God told them, look here, because of sin now, in chapter 3, verse 16, your husband will now be your boss and you will be dependent on him. Sin broke the marriage covenant from being a, a covenant to a contract. And that is why later on we had people having multiple wives. You know, Jesus was speaking and he told his disciples, he said that from the beginning, God made them male and female, husband and wife, not wives. It was not God's intention for polygamy to come in. And that is why in the New Testament, when Christ made all things new by his death and resurrection, he took us back to the original purpose of God for marriage. And that is why if you believe in the Bible, you marry one wife, not two wives. Monogamy, not polygamy. Because that was the original purpose of marriage, a covenant relationship. It was a covenant relationship based on God's word. So now, you should understand that you are not what your education background, your financial uh, 
stay too slow. Your worth is actually the purpose of your life, not your cash in the pocket. Jesus said, a man's life is not, uh, it's not measured by the abundance of the property he has. So now, the husband and the wife are together one flesh. When God took he, the woman out of the man, taking the rib and forming a woman, he created interdependence between husband and wife. He created an interdependence. Please do share this video. Please do share it. He created an interdependence such that the man depends on his wife. Husband depends on the wife. The wife depends on the husband. They work together. Coming together, they become a strong power. The Bible says one will chase a thousand, two will chase... 10,000. So you, you are at least 10 times stronger when you are in unity with your husband. Two becoming one. They chase 10,000 rather than one chasing a thousand. And that is why the Bible tells us that we should not be bitter towards our spouse. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Don't be bitter towards your spouse so that your prayers are not hindered. Yes, there are lots of failed marriages. You see, a lot of erroneous teaching was passed on from one generation to another. A lot of erroneous teaching has been passed on. And we grew up being told very, uh, very funny stuff very funny stuff but i thank god that today the the truth is coming out we are having a greater understanding of god's word and his purposes and so we take note of all these things and we avoid falling into error i i know a lot of people have been teaching what they were taught. The time has come for us to get it right because we are the last generation before Christ comes. We have to get it right now. God wants to release the anointing upon us like never before. And we are also going to be confronted by the enemy like never before. So we need to get it right. Families need to work together. Couples need to function together. The relationship is not competition. It's complementary. When a wife earns more than her husband, the husband is earning more than before. Because the wife and the husband are one. So a husband should not be threatened by the financial success of his wife because she is a part of him. So husbands, do not feel threatened if your wife has a better job than you do. Your family is being prospered by God. Sometimes God can send the finances through the wife more. Sometimes it could be through the husband more. But the union is still based on the principles of covenant. The man is the head over the wife. The wife is the body of the man. You know what? The man is to nurture and protect his wife because she is part of him. She, she on her part, is to support and respect the husband. And then you see the couple doing great exploits. The husband does not compete with the wife. Eve was not richer than Adam or than her husband. Let me use it as it is. The woman was not richer than the man. Eve was not richer than Adam. Adam was not richer than Eve. They both had equal access over all the resources of the earth. But when God called Adam, 
it was the man that spoke on behalf of the couple. You know, when they sinned, God was, uh, God visited and he said, Adam, where are you? The two of them came. It was not until they were out of the garden that the wife got her own identity. She got her own name, Eve. While they were in the garden, it was Adam for the two of them. So when God said, Adam, where are you? The two of them came forward. Then the male spoke on behalf of the two of them. Until sin, there was a perfect unity and understanding of the marriage covenant. After sin, it became competition and uh, it became a contract thing. Men see their wives as the one to cook. In, in Africa, many men see their wives as slaves. I have heard men, when I was growing up, that was what I was taught, that when a man now starts making money, he needs someone to cook for him in the house, and so he should go get a wife so she could cook for him. And that, oh, the man now wants to have sex without paying prostitutes, so he should just buy a wife, put her in the house, and she becomes his bedmate. And then when the woman wants to advise the man on certain things the man is doing, probably in business, say, ah, let's reason this thing out together and see how we can move forward. But hey, shut up. What do you know? Go and sit down somewhere, woman. That came because of sin. You know, when a husband and wife are in unity and are walking according to covenant, you will notice that the man sees the big picture, the woman sees the details. Both need each other. They need each other. They need each other. There is an interdependence. An interdependence. Because there are things that a woman is tuned up to discern spiritually much better than a man. Let me give you an example. You know, some women would say, they will tell their husband, I don't trust that fellow. And he says, why? why? What is it about him you don't trust? I don't trust him. Look at his eyes. And the man looks at the fellow's eyes. He sees an eyeball. He sees a retina. And he sees the eyebrow. And says, what's different there? The woman says, look into his eyes. Can't you see? This guy is not true too. The woman is seeing some details. She is trained to sense some details. That the man will not <laughs> find easy to discern. Look at it this way. A man and his wife are discussing their children. The man's mindset is this child should have food, this child should go to school and become this. That's what he's thinking about. Ensure the child has food, education. And yet the wife will say, I don't think this, uh, this girl is herself today. What comes to the man's mind? Okay, has she eaten? She says yes. Did she break her leg? No. So what's wrong with her? He said she has just been acting a little different. And he's looking at the girl. She's still wearing the same clothes she has been wearing. She's still having the same voice. But the woman can sense something is wrong. She is trained to, to get the details. The man is getting the big picture. Many a times women are not thinking about their children's education in future. Whether they will be doctors, they will be lawyers, they will be business people or whatsoever their mind is on the details have you eaten are you all right how are you feeling the man is thinking about that these two come together to become a whole god deals with us by covenant and that was why he exhibited it as uh, uh that he established marriage as a covenant, not a contract. So, brethren, do your part. Do your part in that marriage. Do your part in that marriage. Approach the marriage 
from a Christian point of view. Even if your partner is failing, approach it from a Christian point of view. The Bible says that God is not unfaithful as not to reward your labor of love. In other words, God rewards your labor of love. Sometimes the labor is tedious. Sometimes it is not. When the partner is cooperating, it's easy. When the partner is not cooperating, it becomes a labor, a tedious labor of love. But one thing you should know is that God rewards it. Some of you will get to heaven and see a mighty reward waiting you. And you say, I didn't win souls to Christ. As I, I, maybe only two or three people gave their lives to Christ. But why do I have this reward? And the, Bible, and, <laughs> and the angels will say, you lived with a very nasty husband. Or you lived with a very nasty wife. And you still loved that person. You, you deserve a medal for this. You will receive medals in heaven because of the person you were married to. Some of you. Because despite the person you were married to not being faithful to the covenant, not being, not exercising his role in the covenant, you were faithful. You maintained that. You were different. Despite you had no reason to, you remained faithful. And so you get a medal in heaven for that. Your rewards will be in heaven. And your children will bless you because what you sow, you reap. When you respect authority, your authority will be respected. The reason why nobody could defeat David, even when his son Absalom temporarily overthrew him, God dealt with Absalom. You know why? David respected authority. He had every opportunity to kill Saul. He didn't take it. He was respectful to Saul till the end. Despite he was the one playing music for the demon that was in Saul to live. When the demon was harassing Saul, he would play the harp. The demon would go. He still respected Saul. Saul that wanted to kill him. He still respected Saul. He respected authority and so God established his authority. Because you honor your husbands, you honor your wives, God gives you God makes you respected by your children. God blesses you for that. God rewards every act of service. The Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. It is a service unto God. The same way husbands are also to respect their wives. It is a service unto God. When you understand that covenant is founded on truth, that covenant is God's way of dealing, you will approach marriage as a covenant. That is how God established it. It became a contract. Or rather, people approached it as a contract later on because of sin. Remember Genesis 3.16. Then... When sin entered, the man, the husband became the ruler over the wife. The wife became a dependent. Many a times, women assume that they are to be dependent on their husbands. No. The original thing is two of you are to be partners. You are both assets to each other. No matter how, even if you are not working as a wife, you think you are not working because you are not earning a salary. You are working because you are maintaining the home front. If that home falls apart, that man will not have the focus to earn what he is earning. Husbands, take note. Your wife may not be bringing in a salary, but the work she is doing is as essential as the one you are doing. You may be bringing in the cash, but she is ensuring that you are focused and blessed enough to enjoy that cash. She is making sure you are able to enjoy the cash. So sometimes men look at their wives and say, oh, you are nothing. Shut up. You don't know what you are saying. Do you have money? Are you making the money? Keep quiet. That is sinful and stupid because she is, and she is protecting you from micro attacks. You are protecting her from macro attacks. Two of you need each other. She may not bring in salary, but she's playing a role. 
That's what marriage is. You become something. She is playing a role in your life that none other can play. So don't look at your wife based on whether she's bringing in money or not. Look at her based on the role she's playing. She is your backbone. The backbone is in the body. If you crush your backbone, no matter how handsome your face is, you will be on one spot. You will not be able to move. And wives, whether you are earning higher than your husband, more educated than your husband, if you destroy your head, if you are brain dead, you are a vegetable. You are useless to yourself if you destroy your head. You need each other. Approach marriage the way God says we should approach it. And he will bless you. Your children will bless you. You will receive a reward because you labored in love. Father, I thank you. Give us the grace to obey your word. It is not easy. It is not easy. But Lord, we ask you for grace. Grace to approach marriage as a covenant, not a contract. To approach marriage as giving 100%. Marriage is not 50-50. It's 100%, 100%. Give us that grace. And Lord, I pray for healing to marriages, restoration of marriages, restoration of broken homes, healing of, of broken homes. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you turn the spouses, their hearts, the hearts of the spouses to you. That the unbelieving husband will repent and become a believer through the work of your Holy Spirit. The unbelieving wife, the unbelieving wife will repent, become born again. We ask, Lord, that you intervene in every home. Turn the hearts to you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are not yet married, that they will make the right choice. They will not choose according to the physical, but they will choose according to the spiritual. They will go after those that have their DNA, the one that has his or her DNA, spiritual DNA, and not entangle themselves with those of a different spirit. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to give room for those who want to give their hearts to Jesus Christ. If you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you are going to pray with me. I want you to pray with me right now. If you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ, pray this prayer with me. Just repeat these words. Lord God Almighty, I come to you today. I surrender my spirit. I surrender my soul. I surrender my body unto you. I repent of my sins. And I ask that you forgive me and cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I accept him as such. Write my name, please, in your book of life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Preserve me holy and righteous till the day I meet you. Thank you, my Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God has become your Father. See the covenant. He deals with us with covenant. He has become your Father. He has become your Father. Okay, I think I can see some comments. I couldn't see comments earlier, but now I'm able to see some of them using my computer. Yeah, women work multiple jobs on scene. That is true. That is true. Women have a role. That's why I said 
Husbands, respect your wives. They are playing a role that none other can play. They are actually placing you in a position to enjoy that money you think only you got. The man is doing his business. He's not doing it alone. He's being backed up by his wife. That is why he's able to focus. Give me the bread. So we're going to take the communion right now. Our bread. We're going to break bread. Bread that is baked without salt. I'm sorry, without yeast. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, it's baked. Flour, salt, oil, water. That's all. Sugar. Okay, yes. You bake it, but no yeast. That's unleavened bread. That's what is used for the communion. Jesus told us to take the bread and break it. He said as often as we do it, we should do it in remembrance of him. He values it so much that he wants us to do it as often as we choose in remembrance of him. We proclaim his death and resurrection and all the things that come with it. We proclaim it each time we take the communion. So lift up your unliving bread. Father, we thank you for this bread. We thank you. We ask that you turn this ordinary bread into the body of Jesus Christ in us. And that everything that is lacking in us, every good thing lacking in us, will receive a new one from the body of Jesus. Every dying and dead good thing that ought to be in us will receive a new one, a replacement from the body of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that whatsoever could not stay, whatsoever is not in the body of Jesus will not be in us. Failure, insecurity, sickness, frustration, let it not be in us because we belong to Christ. Lord, we thank you. And we invoke the benefits of the covenant of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ in our lives and families. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you break the bread. It's very important. You do it. Wherever you are, you take your bread or your wafer, you break it. And then we take this. We're going to take the cup. If you have fruit juice, that's nice. If you have, um, if you don't have water, I'm sorry, you don't have fruit juice, go get some water and put it um, in a cup. Mm. Put it in a cup. We are going to be praying. Lift it up unto the Lord. Father, we give you thanks for this cup, the contents of this cup. We are grateful, Lord. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask that you turn this fruit juice, this water, into the blood of Jesus in us. The blood that was shed for the new covenant of the forgiveness of sins. You are our Father. We are your children. You are our defense. We belong to you. Bless us and keep us in, life, in accordance to your, with your covenant. Lord, we ask, even as the life is in the blood, that the life of Christ will reign in us, in our bodies. Jesus did not sin. Lord, give us grace to live a sinless life. Give us a love for righteousness and a hatred for sin. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we take it, fruit juice, any, any liquid, as long as it's not alcohol, take any consumable liquid, right? And it could be fruit juice, water, any consumable liquid, as long as it's not alcohol. Amen. And lastly, we we'll go for the oil. Go for the anointing oil. 
the bible says touch not my anointed do my prophets no harm by the way please do share this video you can host watch parties let's get people really blessed okay I, I welcome everyone joining in. I may not see, I'm not actually seeing all the comments, but I just want you to know that God, I'm grateful that you are commenting. Keep commenting, liking, and sharing. It's good. I do appreciate that. Lift up your oil. The Bible says if there is any sick, you should be anointed with oil. So anointing the sick with oil is scriptural. The Bible says, do not touch my anointed, do my prophets no harm. So it is scriptural. So now I'm going to pray for your oil. It can be olive oil, granite oil, um, any other kind of oil. Okay? It must not, it's, it, it's not, if you don't have olive oil, it doesn't mean you cannot <laughs> partake in this anointing. Go get some cooking oil. Cooking oil you have not used yet. The fresh one, just take a little. Father, I thank you for every oil lifted unto you. We pray, Lord God, that you turn this ordinary oil into holy anointing oil by filling it with your power and your fire and that your power will come upon everyone anointed with this oil we ask for healings deliverances breakthroughs protection over everyone anointed we pray lord god that demonic yokes be broken off that people be delivered as they are anointed as their photographs are anointed as their clothes are anointed they may not be there but when their clothes are anointed wherever they are it, the anointing will come upon them we thank you father in jesus name amen so you take a little just like this you say i receive it in jesus name you place it on your head you can just place just a little quantity on your door or on the floor of your home and and command every evil presence out of your house and ask that God fills your home with his presence. Man, if the presence of God is in your home, you will know. Things will make sense around you. Thank you all for participating in this service. Thank you for your comments, your likes, your shares. I do appreciate them. I appreciate your feedback, hearing from you, the questions, the words of encouragement. Thank you for supporting this ministry financially, through prayers, through whatever way you've been supporting and you intend supporting. Thank you. We do appreciate your support. Keep praying for my family. We've been experiencing things. You know, normally attacks come just like I was. I, I came in about seven minutes later than usual because I was battling with my computer. For some reason, the computer was refusing to go live. Okay? So sometimes we have interferences in our services, but we would always finish the service by the grace of God. Thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And by the way, I some, I'm kind of limited in my ability to share the video. So there are some of you whose groups I am a member of. There are groups on Facebook I'm a member of, but you don't see me posting regularly. It's because of the censorship. There's restriction on my ability to post. God bless you. Thank you.